Uh, welcome to a special edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour in Con. The reason we've decided to do the show on such a short uh, timescale is that um, I only la discovered last week that um, an associate of mine, Jake Murray, is going to be doing a live uh, or a production of the uh, Beckett play Endgame, um, which will be uh, going out on the web. Um, Jake will explain this in greater detail during the interview. Just a very quick little bit of background. Uh, Jake Murray is the son of Brian Murray, who some of you may recall we interviewed or I interviewed on this show around about three or four years ago. Braham was somebody, an extraordinary person. I have to say that um, we met uh, or we were introduced by Tom Priestley, the son of J.B. Priestley. And the reason we joined together was we were both very interested in the writings of J.B. Priestley and specifically a play by J.B. Priestley that was unknown. Well, it's not unknown, but it's very rarely known. I've only known one reference to this particular play, which was called Time Was, Time Is. And Braham and I became instantaneous friends. It was one of those kind of circumstances. We just met for a coffee and we just got on like a house on fire and we became really, really good friends. Um, and sadly, um, Braham um, died a couple of years ago and it was quite a shock to everybody involved. But it does mean now that I'm now in contact with his son, Jake. And in fact, Jake is working with, funnily enough, um, the next guest on Consciousness Now, Maggie Latorell, in a play that they'll be doing on the book we'll be talking about with Maggie in a few days' time. Um, but I, I don't know a great deal about Jake, other than we've met once uh, one of his theatre productions. I think it was at the German Theatre in, um, in London. Uh, for one of his productions. So, Jake, maybe if you could introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about yourself. Very, very quick background. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me on, on this. Thanks for your lovely words about my dad. Um, so myself, I'm a theatre director as well. Uh, I've been directing nearly for nearly 30 years now. Um, mo and I've split most of my time either freelancing uh, and running my own company or or being in in kind of professional theatres. Um, and at the moment, I run a company called Elysium Theatre Company, which I founded up in the northeast. That's where I live. I live up in Durham. Uh, and I founded it with a friend of mine who was living in my flat in Manchester, who's an actor that I trained called Danny Solomon. Um, when I moved up here, I'd, I'd uh, met someone, um, fallen in love and got married. And I thought that coming to the northeast would be the end of my theatre career. Um, I didn't know anybody up here um so I contacted my friend Danny who lives in Manchester and we we talked about um we met in a cafe in Waterstones in the center of town and we talked about founding a company uh and to our amazement um after our first show which was in 2017 which played in Durham and Manchester in a fringe theatre called 53-2 we're now uh what is it three three four years on uh we've done six productions we've won um several awards this year we won um the an Owen Weimark award from the British uh the Guild of um uh, British Writers Guild of Great Britain um, for something called the COVID-19 monologues, which is 10 monologues that we recorded. We commissioned 10 writers, got 10 actors, and they're all online, um, uh, completely free, available to anybody if you want to see them. Some of them deal with quite controversial subjects. Uh, one called Fake deals with conspiracy theories, uh, and the main character is a woman who doesn't believe COVID is real. Um, and that's quite an interesting one. Uh, but they're all, they all deal with things that are going on at the moment. So last year, one of them dealt with... Um, imagined uh the man who had to write the eulogy at edward colston's um funeral you know the man the bristol slave trader who was thrown into the scene mm -hmm. that so that we're picking up on black lives matter another one which is just we've just heard has been nominated as a finalist in an award a film competition in america which deals with south africa and apartheid and then we've got plays that deal with carers all sorts of different things so we're coming out of covid um uh riding high uh, and um, we are planning, uh, as well as the end game that's on this weekend, we've also got a live stream show coming up in the middle of June, which we're hoping to tour again later in the year. Um, we have a planned production of A Doll's House for next year. And we're widening our remit. We're going to more and more theatres, more and more towns, more and more cities. Um, uh, 
and gaining profile. And it's very exciting. It's the most productive um, time of my life. Um, and I think my dad would be very proud. Interestingly, I've kind of done what he did when he started out because he founded the mm. Century Theatre in Manchester. And he always used to say that um, what you do is you found a theatre where there isn't that much theatre. And then suddenly everybody is interested. And that's exactly what's happened up here. Um, and the environment up here is amazing. People are warm and welcoming. Um, uh, the kind of creative pool of people I now know and work with up here is is incredible. Um, it's rich pickings. There's loads of potential up here. And I often say to my f- friends down in London who are working in cafes and bars, trying to get work on, just come up here and work in a cafe and bar and we'll get a lot of work on. So it's good times. Why Elysium? Um, that's because my wife is a classic scholar. Um, she is, uh, we actually knew each other at university, oddly enough. Um, she's head of classics at a school here in Durham. Um, and we both have a passion for ancient Greek culture. So I love Greek tragedy. Um, I love Greek philosophy. I love Homer. Um, and so I named it kind of in honor of her because Elysium is the, is the Greek name for the equivalent of heaven, um, the, the happy hunting grounds. Um, and that was the name and it's, it's stuck. Um, it often causes a lot of hilarity when people mispronounce it. So we've been called an asylum theatre company. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. But um no, it, it's great. That's why it's so so it's connect we connect ourselves with ancient Greece in that respect. But the work is very modern. That's really good to know, um, in terms of ancient Greece, because Sarah and I were both involved in a recreation of Plato's cave um oh, around, nice. about 18 months ago at uh, the Dracolo Dracolo tunnels. And oh. we're planning with my Greek publisher to possibly recreate Plato's cave in the location of Plato's cave, which is the cave of Vari, which is just south of Athens along the coast um, yeah. on the, the Athen- Athenian Riviera. And it was going to be really interesting to try and recreate Plato's cave in Plato's cave, uh, particularly because, you know, the old idea of what is reality, how how perception works and everything else as well. So yeah. it's going to be quite an exciting thing. And we were, were hoping to do it this year, but unfortunately with the way things are, it's yeah. not really the right time to be doing things like this, but let's, let's move on then. So in terms of the productions you've done so far, um, you clearly have a, a very interesting theme and angle on things. And I, I was particularly interested as to your interest in Beckett uh, and and why that is. So can you tell us a little bit about, for the people out there that probably don't know a great deal about Samuel Beckett, who he was and why his, why his writing and his plays are so extraordinary? Yeah, well, okay. So, well, as a huge subject, Be- Beckett is um, regarded as one of the great playwrights of the second half of the 20th century. Um, and the play he's most famous for, Waiting for Godot, um, is seen as iconic in terms of um, uh, creating on stage a metaphor for how everybody feels and felt after the Second World War, the kind of sense of helplessness and despair and meaninglessness, but also waiting and hoping that something will come along to to turn things around. So that whole sense of the existential kind of crisis of 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 that era, which we're still kind of living through in a different way, even though we're much more comfortable now and distracted by so many other things. Um, Beckett was seen as embodying that and all his work, Uh, He wasn't originally a playwright. Originally, he was a novelist, but he's not as well known as a novelist to the public. Um, Godot's done all over the world. It's done in all all languages. Um, It's a kind of perennial favourite. And he carried on writing for the stage all his life. Um, And one of the most fascinating things about the stage work he wrote was that as he wrote, every play gets shorter. Uh, none of the plays are naturalistic. Um, every single one is in sense, in one sense, surreal and heightened. Um, and he uses the most vivid kind of unusual imagery. Uh, he was famous for being part of what was called loosely the theatre of the absurd, which is supposed to represent that kind of existential confusion, uh, the postmodern chaos, um, surrealism. Uh, so the first play, Waiting for Godot, is about two tramps waiting for someone called Godot, who's promised he will meet them, but never turns up. And at the end of every day, um, a boy arrives and tells them that he will come tomorrow and you don't know you only have two acts uh but for beckett um the curtain would go down one night and then it would come up and the whole story would start again so the story this is why um i think you're interested in it is is Mm. that there's this constant sense of cycles that of reality closing round on itself um and the characters are aware of the fact that things are turning back on themselves that they're in loops um and are trying to find their way out um trying to make sense of it all but what he was trying to do with his theatre was find a metaphor um, uh, which would have succinctly sum up 
what he was interested in. And as the plays got shorter and shorter and shorter, those metaphors became more and more visual, more and more unusual. Uh, so the, the, the famous one, which is almost like a parody of a Beckett, is called Breath, which is one page where the lights come on at the beginning. Um, there's, a, there's a waste ground everywhere. Uh, you hear someone breathing in, the lights come up, then the lights go down as they breathe out and that's the end of the play and that was his metaphor so he has plays where i mean i've done several of them crap's last tape where it's a man on his own in his den listening to tapes of his past um trying to come to terms with who he is now um footfalls which um when I, i've directed that twice and it was only the second time that i realized that he saw the character on stage who's a woman pacing up and down uh, as a ghost and the idea was that she was supposed to be dematerializing um uh rockaby where it's a, a woman in a rocking chair um constantly rocking and speaking in in time to the to the to the, to the chair uh, not i which is the famous just a mouth a lit mouth on that stage. was the one i was trying to remember yeah. yes yeah. Uh, and the very, very last one called What Where I Think, where four characters called Bim Bam, Bom and Bem are interrogating each other, trying trying to work out, trying to come up with an answer to a question that, that we don't know. And uh, a lot of them aren't, for most people, they're almost installation art, the later ones, because they're so unusual. Uh, he also wrote for television. Uh, he wrote sketches. He wrote one film for Buster Keaton that was never made. Um, uh, but he was con the, the 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 key to him was was two real things in terms of his style. One was that it was always surreal. It was always heightened, like something out of Kafka or Expressionism. Uh, the imagery is always um, unusual and haunting and poetic. And the other is the language. Um, and Beckett was a real stage poet, uh, and he was trying he would write with such precision and finery with everything he wrote almost to the point where, uh, um, uh, where you find when you work with him, that if you get a line wrong or you ignore a full stop or you ignore a pause, you destroy the meaning of the piece of work. It's almost like Zen. It's that precise. And of uh, course it's peculiar, isn't it? That of course his plays, as I recall, and I may be wrong on this, were all originally written in French and then translated into English. Yeah. Well, that was true of the, of, of, of most of them. Um, mm. uh, certainly the early ones, um, Endgame was, fin de partie, uh, Godot was. But there's a really interesting thing about this is that the texts aren't the same. Um, mm. And uh, when we were studying Endgame, it was my dad who told me this, and it's true, it's still the case, that the French text of Endgame has a significant difference to the English text. Um, right at the end of the play, uh, I'm not going to give anything away when I say that one of the characters sees a boy in the distance. In the French text, um, there are all these biblical references, religious references to the Buddha, to Moses and Christ. And in the English text, he takes them out. So in the French text, the child is representative of something much more mystical, to do with rebirth, something kind of connected to the religious. Uh, and in the English, you get no details at all. Um, and there's also a fascinating thing at the end of the play where Clove is about to leave. In the French version, he sings Hammer Song, but he doesn't in the English version. So um, something happened whereby Beckett clearly decided the English version needed to be less, be, be more severe. Uh, but he didn't go back and change the French version. And the story goes that he, when he wrote the English versions, he didn't regard them as translations, as, as we would think of them as translations. But if you know the English and you read the French, you can see how well it's translated. He said it was almost, he said he, his goal was to make them as if he was writing an entirely new play. Interesting. So, um, and what's fascinating is that when scholars write about Beckett, they talk about the English versions and tend not to talk about the French. Whereas if you look at the French versions, there are significant differences. I think in the French version of Godot, there's a passage in which Vladimir talks about what it would be like spending the night with Godot if Godot had arrived. So you have a, a vision of, of what that kind of salvation might be. But in the English version, you don't get it. It's much more um, elusive. Mm. So that's it's absolutely because he, he was Irish. Uh, he was a Protestant Irishman from a, a well off background um, who essentially left Ireland to live in France. Um, and he was um, James Joyce's um, uh, secretary for years. There's a wonderful story about about um, when Joyce was 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 dictating Finnegan's Wake. He didn't write the stuff down. He dictated it where um, uh, Beckett was was scribbling away and Joyce was dictating and someone knocked on the door and Joyce said, come in. So Beckett wrote down, come in, thinking it was part of the dictation. So whoever it was came in and there was a conversation and then they went out. And Joyce said, um, so read me, read me that back. I'm not going to do an Irish accent. Uh, and Beckett read it back and Joyce said, hang on a second. 
read that again and he read it and he said i didn't say come in and he said yes you did um and he said no, that was the person coming in and becky said you want me to take it out and joyce thought for a minute and said no leave it in um and he felt that the accident of the person coming in was as good a reason to put the piece of right word in you know that reminds so, me in many ways of the man from porlock in yes. terms of the knocking on the door exactly. now one of the things i must i must come in here for <laughs> something has made my heart just jump um because in the chat room um we've got a message to say brian murray is watching oh really there we are uh, so somebody must be using hopefully somebody oh, is using pat. that would be pat weller oh fantastic because i thought for a second but isn't it wonderful to think that brian would be watching this in some way well i'm sure he, if you can get a signal in the afterlife i'm sure he's uh he's tuning in <laughs> okay hello pat if that if um if that is indeed you rather than brian tuning in but uh, yes because I, I was thinking along the lines recently in terms of of the the parallels between the writing of beckett and um and joyce and of course you know the whole circularity of finnegan's wake in the last line is these the is the first line and of course then you have the wonderful line in um in godo where it says to give birth astride a grave yeah so again you have this kind of circularity and of course i was reminded and i mentioned it to you recently you know the the, the writings of people like flan o'brien and the third policeman and the idea of everybody trapped in this kind of purgatory type world which is not really real it's 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 kind of somewhere but nowhere and that leads us in really beautifully to well the first question i'd love to ask is why do you think he he because he during the war he was involved with the french resistance and everything else as well but why do you think he was so intrigued and and was motivated to write such incredibly different and odd plays was there something about his background or his personality that made him interested in doing that um i think it was the way his imagination worked um uh, there's an interesting thing when i was doing crap's last tape a couple of years ago we found out that there's a there's a passage in crap's last tape where crap talks about um suddenly having a vision of what he needed to be able to write how he wanted to write and apparently it was based on a, on a revelation that beckett himself had the struggle he had as as joyce's secretary was he couldn't find his own authentic voice and he thought that what he needed to do was write like joyce those huge enormous kind of encyclopedic baggy books full of words and life uh, and 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 one of the things that that informs beckett's work is is depression and despair and alienation and and, and fear um, and apparently in a bout of depression while he was in his bedroom he had a vision that he suddenly understood that instead of trying to run from that despair he needed to make make it the subject of his work and instead of trying to write like joyce who was trying to write life-affirming kind of comics work he had to make his struggle with existence what he was going to write and instead of being as i say profligate with his words he needed to be minimal so his goal was to uh, uh, write plays which would use as little um, uh, would be as economic as possible on stage. I think he was profoundly influenced by uh, all sorts of the of the movements of the time. So I mean, he must have been massively influenced by Kafka because you have the same kind of um, surreal, kind of nightmarish game playing world. Because I always he, thought Ionesco as well. Was, Ionesco, well, they were contemporaries. Um, right. so they were both writing in Paris at the same time, oh. but also people like. Um, he must have been interested in he was he was he would have also been interested in all those kind of dante-esque what you know the parables and and um he was steeped in theology so he knew his augustine and all that kind of stuff i think i mentioned the other day that the the the, the incredible passage in the middle of um portrait of the artist of the young man where a jesuit priest is describing this vision of hell as a vast infinitely large steel ball and every year a bird brushes a wing against it um and even uh, if that bird lasted you know however long it would have taken that brush to eventually make it into nothing that would just be the beginning of your time in hell so i think the point for beckett was that was that realism wasn't what he was interested in he was trying to find these images almost geometrical images which would encapsulate what he was trying to trying to convey and that's what makes them so timeless and the interesting thing that we found whenever you work on them is although they're very um surreal and they operate in this strange abstract surreal world they're full of references to the real world mm. uh, uh so um um what's uh Vladimir Estegon talk about being one of the first to be on the Eiffel Tower and you were mentioning just a moment ago about about um Nag and Nell uh losing their legs in a in a, a bicycle crash in the Ardennes 
you know so there's a real world attached to it but somehow the characters have left the real world behind and are existing in this other zone um where reality is not what it seems to be um and the uh, the the reason why one of the reasons why i think i contacted you about this is that is that is that in in um uh some of the plays there is not least there's this sense of being in purgatory or in sort of some dante-esque mm. hell uh where i think there's one called this is called play where it's three burial urns with the heads of the people talking uh and they're talking about this strange manage that they had so they some kind of dante-esque hell ring of hell there's also a, a tv uh thing called a joe the original one of uh, transmission of which is in um on YouTube, well worth watching, which is very much like a, um, again, like a kind of Kafkaesque kind of torture chamber thing where this man is haunted by the voice of a woman that killed herself because of him. Um, and the, you know, the plays are often full of guilt, they're full of despair. Um, uh, that sounds awfully depressing, but the beautiful mm. thing about the plays is they're often very funny mm. and they're very moving and very warm about people. Um, an end game in particular is, is, is I think relevant to, to, to your kind of explorations, because one of the interpretations of the play, those of you who don't know it, it's set in a chamber, uh, a gray chamber. Um, and all you've got in the chamber are two dustbins in which the parents of the main character ham are being kept. You find out they're in there about 10 minutes in. Um, and, uh, in the wall are two windows. And outside the window, one of the characters, Clov, he's the only able-bodied one of them, constantly looks out of the window to check if there's any signs of life. And the vision of the world outside the window is, is this devastated, grey, lifeless world where there's nobody left. So they're in a shelter. Uh, you never find out what caused the destruction, but one of the interpretations of the play is that, is that it's inside someone's skull and that the eyes are... So the windows are eyes. And, and this is why I suppose Beckett was so precise in his instructions that the, the, the layout of the stage had to be exactly as he described it. Because I, I read somewhere that he had one production had done something where the, the right. places weren't. And he, 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 he was He's very curious. upset about it. Yeah. Well, when he died, he left instructions with the estate that nothing, his stage directions had to be followed to a T. Nothing could be cut. Uh, and visually it had to be as he described it um, mm. because the visual metaphors of his plays were absolutely crucial to what he was trying to do. What it was, was it was a production, I think, in America somewhere, in uh, which was set in, the director had set it on the New York subway uh, and Beckett was furious and said, if I'd set it on the New York subway, I would have, I would have, I would have written that. Um, uh, within within his stage directions, there's room for a designer to come up with their own vision and the directors to come up with their own vision. But the meta visual metaphors are absolutely key. And so the theory, one of the theories in Endgame is it, is that it's going on in the last moments of a person's mind. Uh, and the closer that they get to death, the further away that is. And a, a, a key kind of uh, they can't finish. They're in a constant game end game which never comes to a conclusion which is all the chess metaphor in the play um and and the philosopher that's constantly referenced is zeno zeno's paradox mm -hmm. of the closer you get to the end um the further away it is and that's um so the play is about weariness it's also about someone coming to terms with their life ham is tormented by his life um and the things he's done and it's full of regret but at the same time his ego drives him on he still he still tries to survive he refuses to admit defeat there's a wonderful moment where Clove says let's stop playing and, and ham shouts out never um and it's thought that the my dad always used to say this was that the main characters um vladimir and estragon ham and Clove, they're the mind and the body and in in uh endgame ham is blind and confined to a wheelchair and Kov Clove is able-bodied and can see but he can't sit down so Clove ends up being the carer for ham um uh but 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 the relationship is is disintegrating as if the 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 body and the mind of a dying person is splitting apart um and actually uh, the inspiration for this production because i as i said i did it when i was 16 i did a workshop with a group of actors in london um online no less via zoom during covid where we looked at endgame because i'd done a, a workshop on beckett and they'd all started off by saying i'm totally mystified by him and by the end of it said can we do a workshop on endgame well, we did a workshop on Endgame, and out of that, we had what was lovely about it was all the actors are pretty much over 60, I think. And you very rarely get to do Endgame with actors of that age. Um, and we found in particular that the the two actors who were playing um uh the the um the parents in the bins brought a dimension to that text which you just wouldn't normally get. 
So we decided we would do an online production and that's where it came out of. Um, and one of the one of the people in the workshop talked about the fact that the play reminded her of when she was caring for her mother mm. um, and the frustrations and the comedy uh, and the anger and the, and the surrealism of it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. So lots of fascinating stuff to explore. I mean, one of the things that uh, it seems, you know, there's an awful lot of codependency going on. Yeah. And there was one line that struck me many years ago when I first came across it. And it's the line whereby um, Clove turns around and says, was it, it he turns around and he said that, um, I, or or the, the, the main guy turns around and says, I will stop feeding. No, th there was the thing about whether he, he would, if he'd die he, in the kitchen, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the idea, I'll set an alarm if I die. Um, so you'll you'll know that um, no, I'll set an alarm if I leave, wasn't it? Because there's always this leaving. There's the yeah. kind of everybody's dependent upon everybody else in such a way. You know the the, way, the idea that Clove can't ever sit down. Yes. So he has to be standing, whereas whereas um, Ham cannot stand up. That's right. And it's almost the human condition, isn't it? The way we become dependent. But if we then link that to the, the the psychology of it, and when I was reading it again, I was I was reminded of the fairly obscure J.B. Priestley play. I think it was called The Dragon's Mouth. Yeah, I don't know that one. It's where you have four characters, almost like Pirandello, isn't it? But it's not. Where you have four characters who have, are isolated from um, a ship because there's been, there's been some outbreak of an illness and they're in isolation knowing whether they're going to be okay or not. Mm -hmm. And they're inside a, a, a yacht inside a place called a cave, which is called the devil's mouth or the, 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 the dragon's mouth. And there are four characters and the four characters talk to the audience and it's based upon the Jungian archetypes. And it's the, the four types of personality that became part of psychometric testing. And this, again, shows just how clever in many ways and how underestimated J.B. Priestley is as well. And I just thought I'd drop that in there. Priestley was doing some quite interesting stuff as well. But in terms of, um, I'd very quickly like just to bring Sarah in now. Have you got any thoughts or ideas? Because we always, I always drag Sarah in at some stage and ask her opinions. Well, a lot of what you were saying, Jake, really made me think of the mystery plays yeah. and that there may be a kind of surreal archetypal element in these whereby the, like you say, those visual metaphors are processed uh, uh, when you sleep at night and in your dreams, because they're the mm -hmm. kinds of things that probably get in your dreams. And I've often thought that the experiences in the telesterion in the mysteries would have been processed in that subconscious state actually more deeply. And that's where you would have had the integration. So I wonder what you think Beckett's goal was as the hierophant if you like what was his goal for his initiates coming to view well it's yeah it's really interesting because you bring up something really really fascinating is that when i was a kid in the 80s growing up reading beckett uh, under the shadow of you know the cold war and endgame is very much a cold war play in terms of one of the things you can't help thinking about it is is it a nuclear war that has devastated the world is that you're told that beckett was the famous atheist who didn't you know um uh uh that the nihilist etc etc was about existential angst and despair but when you actually look at the works in its entirety they're actually very religious they're steeped in religious ideas um and um i i would i would say of beckett um what Jung said of Nietzsche was that uh, Beckett was no atheist, only his God was dead, which was what Jung said brilliantly about, about, about um, Nietzsche, was that they were both artists who were haunted, or both thinkers or artists who were haunted by the notion of, of, of the divine, of God, of meaning. And, it, and in Beckett, I think God is very much about meaning. Um, but none of the characters can reach him or her, however you want to describe God, but they're very much driven by images and tropes to do with, with, with the religious. So for instance, um, one of the first things, right, the whole point in waiting for God, and the reason why everybody keeps on saying, is it, is it about waiting for God? And Beckett apparently said to Ralph Richardson, if I'd thought it was about waiting for God, I would have called it that. Um, but you can't help thinking that the play is about redemption and the characters do talk about uh, religious imagery um, uh, and God. And so do they do in Endgame. And I think that, and there are other plays where it's even more explicit, um, like in Footfalls, where, where the, the, the woman who's a ghost talks about leaning on the arm of Christ. And I think that if, um, uh, if Beckett is a hierophant, I think what he was trying to do, and I think this is what's so, so resonant now, is he was giving us the right to pursue these questions. 
that actually they're not nihilistic plays. Um, they're plays about people who are actually st- searching and groping for some kind of meaning and, and shape and purpose to life. Um, and they all do it in different ways. Some of them do it very banally, like in um, um, Happy Days, where she has her rituals of cleaning her teeth and everything. And others do it more profoundly, um, like, like uh, <clears throat> the character pacing up and down. Um, trying to wrestle with a question that she doesn't understand. Um, and I think that's what he was doing. And I also think actually going back to something that you said, um, Anthony, about dependence, and this is again what people forget about Beckett, is he actually, what's life affirming about them is is actually the thing that keeps the characters alive, is are their human relationships. Although the characters in one sense want to be recluses, are misanthropes, actually they can't let go of the things that matter to us the most, which are which is love. Uh, and um, I'm hoping when you see Endgame, you'll see that the, the 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 ending is heartbreaking. When Ham thinks that Clove has gone, the last speech that he gives when he's on his own and thinks he's facing the rest of his well, the, the last remaining part of his life, um, is is unbearably moving. So my, my feeling, I think Harifant is a really really good point. I don't think that um, a poet of the stage like Beckett would have the resonance he did unless he reached out to people and gave them a life raft of some kind. Does that make sense? So I think, um, and I think if, if you, you know, you can never completely say what you think a writer was trying to do, but my experience of reading his work is that where he actually finds redemption is in us, in the, in the human mind, in, in, in relationships, um, in poetry and creativity. That's what the characters are trying to, to reach for. So that's what I would, I would answer there. But I think that he would have known those passion plays. Um, uh, he would have known Priestley's plays, Anthony. Uh, he would have known the Expressionists. If he was in France, he would have been, you know, rubbing shoulders with people like Dali and Marguerite in Paris, rather. Mm-hmm. He, would have, he would have been with all these artists who were trying to be non-naturalistic. And that's the interesting thing. If, if one of my dreams one day, if I ever ran a theatre, would be to do a season of uh, every decade, uh, a season which reflected the plays that, so you, if you were doing the 50s, you'd do Look Back in Anger, which was the ultimate naturalistic play, uh, and, and Godot, which is the ultimate non-naturalistic play. And they're the two plays that are seen as changing everything in the 20th century. Um, it was a time where everything was changing, a bit like our own in its own way, after the catastrophe of the Second World War. Uh, and some characters were going into this kind of symbolist territory, um, which had existed before the war, and others were going into a naturalistic territory. So in a sense, Beckett was following in the symbolist tradition, the French symbolist tradition, uh, where s- symbols existed in an archetypal realm and, and art and poetry tried to reach out of the naturalistic. Absolutely um, platonic, isn't it? The idea of the Well, I think that's forms. absolutely right. Yes. And I think that's... Um, and again, as I say, a massive influence for him was was Augustine, who was the great Neoplatonic mm. Christian thinker who talked about the duality of body and soul. Um, and there's a great quote from I think Anselm, where it's a it's um, referenced in Godot. He and and this is this tells you everything you need to know about Beckett. He said uh, there's a, there's a there's in it's either Anselm or it's Thomas Akempis, which is one of the thieves was saved. Do not despair. One of the thieves was damned, do not presume. And in a sense, that encapsulates Catholic theology. Um, mm. and Beckett said, what interests me is the symmetry, the perfect symmetry of that line, mm. the shape of it. And yet, and and yet, and, yet, and, yet that, and that's, I think, what he's trying to do with his, with his poetry was to, was to, with his theatre, was to lift it into a kind of, as you say, platonic realm where, where the work would be timeless. Because one of the other things that has always intrigued me about Beckett, and again, I noticed it rereading Endgame, is the way in which he's, he's profoundly postmodernist in the way he works with the relationship between the actors and the audience. Yeah. And he breaks down the glass wall. And there is a wonderful reference in the play, isn't there, where he refers to the audience in some way. Um, as if they know they're being watched, as if they're being observed in some yeah. way, that there is an observer. And of course, that then reminded me, and I thought, well, this is an interesting point, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm halfway through my new book at the moment, and I've just finished reading, um, doing a lot of writing up on Berkeley. And of course, Berkeley's idea, isn't it? You know, that the ultimate observer is God, and yes. that, you know, that everything is, an, uh, is, is, is mind created, but everything is brought into existence by the ultimate observer, God. Whereas when you're in a play, 
you you're almost being create you are you are created individuals and i made the reference before to pirandello because of course pirandello played upon that a lot um and just the idea of who exactly you are and i think it was a kind of a wonderful double reversal and i don't know why immediately the paintings of, of escher came to my yes. mind yeah yeah yep. you know the yes. way which things morph into different things and there's background and foreground um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's that features very powerfully in both Endgame and, and, and Godot. There's a beautiful, beautiful passage, my favourite passage in, in Godot, which I call my, um, I always talk about it being the Satori moment, which is um, where Vladimir is on his own and is looking at, um, he has the, the speech you're talking about, about um, we we give birth, as, was it give birth a stride to grave? Give, give birth a stride to grave, yeah. He puts on the forceps. Um, he, sa- he looks at um, Vladimir, Estragon, who's asleep, and he says, He's he. Uh, what shall I say of today that I that I can't remember what it was that the, the Estragon. I, I spoke with Estragon and he ate a carrot. Uh, he's sleeping. He knows nothing. And then he says, "Of me too." Someone is saying, uh, "He is sleeping. Let him sleep on." Um, and there's an awareness. It's almost it's also like Borges is the other one. You know mm. the one Borges story where the character is having dreams, and then he realizes that he's someone else's dream. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. And of course he wrote this other story, didn't he, about the other Borges? Yes, which is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, but I think so there's a kind of definite hall of mirrors quality to to to, to Beckett and the metaphor of, of actors on the stage, which again is very uh, Jewish. It's very kind of Yiddish. Mm. Um meta- so of the actors on the stage and cl- humans as clowns, because he was also very influenced by Buster Keaton and my music hall. Because that's the interesting thing. I remember this is true of Brecht as well, is that mm. we get very highfalutin about it. But actually music hall was constantly doing that thing of suddenly talking to the audience and breaking the, the, the form. Yeah, I many years ago I acted in um a play The Fire Raisers by Max Frisch. Yes. And I played the the chorus at the front, yes. the fireman in the front. And of course, again, like classic Greek chorus, the, the they talk to the audience and they they describe what's going on. Yeah. So clearly it was very much, as you say, German expressionist theater. It, the influences were quite profound. Yes. Um and when these plays came out, I'm, I'm very interested to know how did the critics yeah, approach well, them? That's right. Well, I, I can't remember the, the, the French. I know that because um, origi- originally Godot came out in France um, and caused a sensation I th- in, in, in the, 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 the Latin quarter. It was, it was, and everyone got very excited about it. And it was Peter Hall, I think, who picked it up and brought it to England. Um, and did the original production in London. And classically, as we look back in anger, that what what you expected happened was that all the critics said, this is appalling, except for the Sunday critic, who I think was Harold Hobson, who said, this is amazing. (laughs) At which point everyone went to see it and said, no, this is amazing. And and Beckett's reputation was was rock solid from then onwards. Uh, And now no one dares criticise Beckett. Um, Mm -hmm. Beckett is seen almost as a kind of cardinal of theatre. Hierophant is a good word. Who you, everyone goes, ah, Beckett, yes. Um, And no one questions it or thinks about it in that way. Um, But, but, he, he it, it it was it was exactly the same as you, what used to happen was Kenneth Tynan and Harold Hobson were the two critics. Kenneth Tynan was the left wing one, Hobson was the more sort of conservative one, and they would look at what everybody said during the week and then say the opposite. And and it was Hobson who uh, rescued Waiting for Godot, and it was Tynan who rescued um, Look Back in Anger, and that's what um, gave Beckett um, his his fame in the UK. Which is not to say it. I mean, the fact is, Hobson was still right. Even even Godot is an extraordinary play. That said, an awful lot of people hate Beckett. When I did um, Crap's Last Tape and Footfalls up here in Durham, we got as many people going. It, it got us our biggest audience that we'd done hitherto because there's loads of people wanted to see Beckett. And then there were all sorts of people who absolutely flatly wouldn't go because it was Beckett. So there are people who, you know, a bad production of Beckett is, is agony. Mm. Um a beautiful production of it is unforgettable. And they're, and they're, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how people respond to Endgame because it's beautiful, but it's very specific. It is very dark. It deals with very dark issues of, of sorrow and grief and, you know, uh, um, but it's very soulful. And whether whether um, in our modern time where, where we're very, the world is too much with us in a sense, um, people don't sit around talking about existential crises in quite the same way. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see how different people react to it. Mm. But, um, but as I say, Beckett is almost like St. Beckett now. Um, and um, 
you know, uh, the other, another very interesting thing on, on that note is is that is that there's that we talked a little bit. This is just a side note. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about um, the French versions and the English versions. There's also something very fascinating about the Irish versions and the English versions of the plays. You know, there isn't an Irish version separate from English version, but if they're done with an Irish accent, the plays become completely different. If you do Godot with Irish accents, uh, it becomes much funnier and warmer, and and uh, wild. Uh, and the more philosophical, melancholy side comes out of the English accent. They're very different. It so that's the cadence of the language, I suppose. Not just the cadence, but the sensibility, the emotional right. sensibility of the work. Um, and um, uh, because the Irish, you know, um, historically, in, the English have always tried to avoid deep questions. And the Irish, live with, with Catholicism and everything, have always lived within them. But they see the humour and the comedy and the, and the black comedy of things in a different way to the English. Um, and, um, it's, it, we've, we've always, I now, whenever we, when I was doing that workshop on Endgame, we, or oh, oh, oh Beckett, as an experiment, I asked the actors to once do it in an Irish accent and then do it in an English accent. And it becomes much more irrever irreverent if it's Irish. It's fascinating. Um, uh, so it's, they're, they're, they're extraordinary pieces of work. You could probably imagine, uh, you know, the, the, the way in which Clove would come across much more insubordinate. Yeah. In his sarcasm. Towards Ham. Well, exactly. Yeah. And no, of course, that's a absolutely. very interesting yeah. reference. Yeah, um, uh, and at the same time, they've you know the other interesting thing about Endgame is it's got a very Middle European quality, um, mm. and they talk about you know, the situation at Kov and the Ardennes and Lake Como. Um, mm. It's it's um, it's and as I say, the other interesting thing that, we, that struck us was it's very much a fifties play because it's also about class. Um, in the in the in the um, if you piece together the information that Ham and Clove give you about how how ham lived it was a it was a manor house it was he was a landowner and very wealthy yes uh, and yes. had paupers and all this kind of stuff um and so there's a whole thing about about the, you know class oppression going on in a sense with with clove as the worker and ham as the as the as the landowner uh, and then there's the mystery of clove's real parentage mm. um of whether clove is an adopted child which is what seems to be the case when when ham is telling his story and certainly what clove thinks happened and then, at, but at other times, Ham refers to Clove as his son. So you don't know. It's 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 full of mystery. Um, mm. And this is, again goes back to, you know, the Atlantean questions of 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 how a human mind and the stories that we tell uh, gropes to make sense of existence and the stories. You know, um, uh, and a, a, another thing of of um, isolation. There's a there's a great line that Ham says where he talks about the solitary child who turns himself into other children, one, two, three, to make sure he's he's not alone. Um, you talked about dependence, that the characters need to be heard. They need to talk. Um, they need to be observed, to feel that they're still alive. There's a great, great line in um, um, Waiting for Godot, where he says, we give us, we, where um, Estragon says to Vladimir, we, we always find something to give us the impression we exist. And Vladimir says, yes, we're, we're magicians. Mm. And then you have an end game in, in happy days when he just needs to keep on talking, you know, silence is the great terror. And that's why pauses and silences are so powerful in Beckett. Um, and in, um, uh, crap's last tape, it's a man alone in his den listening to tapes of himself when he was younger and not recognizing himself. So there's that other mm. huge question of, you know, are we the same person when we're 67 as we were when we were 37? And that weird thing of, 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 you, you must have had it where you you come across something you've written or said 30 years ago and you don't remember writing it. Correct. Yeah. And you might look at it and go, my God, that's that's really good. <laughs> Funnily enough, I was talking uh, yesterday to Maggie Latorell and uh, Maggie was discussing about how she reread and she's rereading her book, The Gift of Alzheimer's, in preparation for her meeting with Sarah and I next week. And she said, you know, I'm rereading it now and thinking, good Lord, did I read that? Did I write that? You know, yeah. that turn of phrase, you know, and we all do it, don't we? We go, good Lord. And I'd argue that's when the demonic takes over and, you know, you're writing, but you're writing almost in this fugue state. And one of the things, again, that struck me about Endgame was the, 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 the circularity. And I particularly was attracted to the story of the suit. And yeah, the way yes. in which, you know, they were making a suit and he kept coming back and the the, the, the guy making the suit kept saying, well, you're going to have to wait another week yeah. and another two weeks. 
and isn't that just a a, um, a, a description of life? Isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's you're always waiting for something to happen. Is this what life is all about? Because we live, don't we, in this kind of structured world of novels and TV, and there's always a start, a beginning, and an end. There's always the denouement at the end where the guy gets the girl or whatever. But life isn't like that, is it? Life just doesn't. It goes on and on as it does in. And one of the things that I, I was really keen to ask you about is what do you think is it is it about writers like Flan O'Brien and and um Joyce and Beckett that has this preoccupation with the eternal return the eternal recurrence the kind of quasi nietzsche and quasi stoic idea that there are cycles and we all go round and yeah. round well i think Why? there is an, there is an element of catholic theology in that and and um uh free the question of being trapped in a universe that you don't fully understand and and um uh the, the, all those images of purgatory and hell and that kind of stuff but i think there's also um for 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 beckett uh it was, I mean, that was what you were just saying about when we were discussing there about, about things that we wrote ages ago. One of the things he's interested in is memory and the fact that we forget constantly that actually somehow our memory is erasing information all the time. You remember that, uh, which we can then get back, but it's fascinating how our subconscious minds decide what we need to remember and what we don't. Um, and, and that thing of, you know, that's the simple thing like you, you, which happens to be all the time where you lock the car and walk away and you go, did I lock the car? Do you know what I mean? I'm glad that's not just me. Oh, <laughs> but God, why absolutely. does the mind do that? And what happened to the reality of locking the car? Do you see mm, what I mean? That's an interesting it's, point. Yeah. It's a, it's erased, isn't it? It yeah. ceases to be. It, it, yeah. It's not part of your history, but it was something you did, and yeah. it's no longer there. Yes. And yes it does make me think of the dream state. And as you say, these plays often take place in this liminal realm between conscious and unconscious. Yeah. And you know, for the example of uh, the... The, th the setting that may be inside someone's head and using those visual metaphors to represent somebody's skull and eyes reminds me a lot of dream logic and how words take these visual forms exactly. in the dream state and they kind of uh, coagulate around you as your consciousness gives them more and more attention. Exactly. And it, it's, it's um, exactly what you're saying. I was going to, I was the dream star, I was going to quote the famous, the one wonderful line in Inception about, can you remember how you got here? Um, and, and there was a great quote that Steiner once gave about reincarnation where he said, um, everybody says, if, if, if we reincarnated, how come we can't remember our past lives? And he, can, he said, can you remember what you were doing this time last week? Mm. So we're constantly putting away the reality of, of things in our minds, but it's not necessarily a conscious process. And that again is something that's going on in all the plays where the characters are trying to find ways of, of mapping out time and space whether it's with tapes or it's telling stories mm. or it's um asking clove to look out of the window or it's keeping talking in in waiting for godot and i think that i think that um the 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 underlying you know we've got the old i think therefore i am so we've got that at least but i forget therefore i am is something else but 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 that is something that the the that the plays are very much about is is what is time and space? You know, what mm. are they? How do we measure them? And if we can't measure them, what happens then? So, um, you know, th and that's why he says habit is a great de deadener. The ordinary rituals, waking up, going to sleep in happy days, there's no um, day and night uh, when he is woken up by a bell ringing. So um, she constantly has her rituals that gives her a sense of what time of day it is. Um, and I think what, what, what Beckett was, was in, in when you're in a depressed state, you are aware of, of the banality of your existence. And I think that is all of everything we're discussing comes back to the same thing of the mystery of consciousness and the mystery of reality. Um, and perhaps giving people in those play experiences that taste of fear, depression, anxiety, so that they then perhaps leave the theatre feeling like, a rebirth as well. Yes, mm, that was absolutely. It's a good point. In the absolutely. In the yeah. Well, the plays ask you to think about your life on a very on a on a, mm. on a on a wonderful level, but they also affirm things. You know, there is humour, there is there is warmth and love in there. But I mean, like the passage in um, in Waiting for Godot, where in the first act, Potso and Lucky, Potso can see and Lucky can hear. In the second act, Potso is blind and Lucky can't. Here. Yes, because there's almost the kind of eternal return exactly. of, the, of the two the two acts, aren't there? Where one yes. is almost a reversal of the other, that's and that's right. quite clever, almost a mirror image. But and nobody comments remember. on it, and nobody remembers. Well, the they fact. do. Um, um, uh, Vladimir does. Vladimir says he's astonished when Potso says, "I'm I can't see." Yes, he remembers them 
being able to see and hear, but Pozzo and Lucky can't remember, and Estragon immediately forgets about them as they've gone off. And at one point, Vladimir says they've changed, unless they're not the same. Uh, so that's the point, is that the characters, yeah. Vladimir and Estragon, who are the mind, are constantly trying to pin down reality, constantly trying to make sense of it all, constantly trying to get a purchase on what's going on. Because uh, almost there's a link here again, isn't there, with, with uh, platonic thought, in that you know is the concept of amnesis and anamnesis yes. and the comment of we 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 forget but we have deliberately forgotten what we really are yeah and we live in this state of amnesis until anamnesis strikes us and we realize that we are something greater than we believe we are yeah. you know we're we're almost all actors within the simulation or within whatever this reality is that we live within and here we have characters who are stuck within this strange world and I, I really did find on rereading it that i found it profoundly affected me in so many ways um that i can't really put my hand on i can't really put my mind on it as to why it did why it disturbed me it's a very disturbing play it's a very as you say it's profoundly sad you know the the, the heartbreaking bit were the parents and they can't touch each other yeah because yeah. they reach out and they try and they say, you know, something, you know, you, do you still love me and everything? And I thought that was awful. The, the kind of the atta disattachment that they had to each other. But they'd laugh about, and he tells a joke, doesn't he? He said, you always yeah. used to laugh at my jokes. Yeah. And, and, and she's saying, well, 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 I did now, but not anymore because yeah. I've heard yeah. it so many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, well, it's just relationships, had, isn't it? We <laughs> had a lot of fun with, with that, with that, with those two actors. And I remember, but really interesting things, like I remember saying to the actor who plays Nag, never let him get sad. Because, because mm. uh, actually, um, Nag is the one who's giving up. Uh, but also has most beautiful poetic moments of the, you, the the sea was clear, the water was clear, and you could see right down to the bottom, so yeah. clean, so white. And I, and and I and uh, but my, the note was that the nag is always upbeat, always trying to keep it going. Because if they and it's that's an, the other fascinating thing is you you really fail with Beckett if you play the characters as if they know they're in a Beckett play. Mm. Um, they're actual fighters. They're they are life affirming. They don't want to go down. Um, and uh, that's the beauty of them. There's there's a, the human spirit in them is fighting against the things that's bringing them down. Um, but I think the reason why it also affects you so deeply is is because it's of the way it's written. That surrealism of it, the poetic imagery of it, resonates like a dream, as Sarah says. It resonates on a subconscious level um, in that platonic zone, whatever you want to call it. So so that you don't you don't it, it bypasses the rational part of your brain, and you understand it on a more on a more profound emotional level. Um, and I think everything that Sarah, you were saying about hypnagogic states, liminal states, depressive states, uh, where the mind and the imagination are doing things that are running away with themselves. Uh, and maybe the subconscious is, is sending images into the conscious mind that it's not expecting to get. Um, I think that informs his plays massively. Um, and it's what makes them challenging and for some people really off-putting and for others, incredibly beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. But it makes him an iconic writer. And I would say, I mean, that's why I think, I hope you will see it, watch it on the weekend, because we we we, we try to bring all this to life, the poetry. Can you tell life. us a little bit about how you pull the production together? Because this is going to be interesting, you know, as to, and is, yeah. it, is it both, is it sound and vision as no, well? No, it, we couldn't do that. Essentially, with, mm. with COVID, everybody's been thrown, everybody in the theatre has been thrown back to basics. <laughs> and we've all started working online. Um, and and um, the big challenge with, with, um, uh, with that, obviously, is you have to rehearse everything via Zoom. Um, and so the piece of work, and, we, and unless you have a lot of technology, um, you can't put sound and all that kind of stuff in. Um, uh, we'd love to have done, and we did try and experiment with with um, a unitary background, but unfortunately, nobody had the technology to do it. You need a green screen to get, have, have exactly the same background, otherwise everyone disappears and becomes kind of odd. Um, so what you're seeing is, is a, is a well-rehearsed reading of the play um uh but really powerfully acted um the actors really worked hard at it we rehearsed it via zoom um all the actors i think are actually down south i watched it up here we actually and we had a chap called patrick keely uh who is also from hastings um uh who read the stage directions but we, with the stage directions we very much wanted them to be a character 
Interesting. Um, but you can't you can't not have the stage directions in the play because they're so ritualized and they're so vivid. But they can't just be flatly read. They're meant they're there to create atmosphere. So he was he was very he very much is is the fifth character in it. Um, uh, it's very simple, very pared back, but we've really focused on the language and the and the actors. What was hilarious was we tried to record it in one take, and of course we couldn't do that. So we recorded it in sections and then edited it so that it became one continuous piece of writing. And that was quite fascinating because we read them all out of sync sequence, rather like when you make a film. Um, but and uh, but it but it worked really beautifully. And actually we've we've we found over COVID that um there are ways of accessing these plays online in these formats which means you get the chance to work on plays that you simply wouldn't be able to work on in the theater because it's prohibitively expensive or you know um uh you know if you put endgame up in in london all sorts of people come and see it but it might not come and see it anywhere else so you're able to access these plays that as theater directors and actors they're often the reason why we became theater directors and actors uh, <clears throat> and you can give people a powerful experience of them online um, in a way that's completely valid. Uh, and we've, we've um, with our COVID-19 monologues and the workshops that we've done, we've decided that we want our online life to continue into when we're back on stages. Obviously, stages is, is what we're all about, but we still want um, that online work to be, to be resonating and part of what we do. And uh, fascinatingly, the, the, the monologues we've done, the COVID-19 monologues, have probably done more in terms of raising our profile and um, uh, giving us kudos and opening doors for us um, than our stage work. Because obviously our, your stage work can only be seen locally, whereas the online work can be seen all over the world. Um, and the what's been lovely about the online work we've done is we've found new actors, we've built relationships with writers, and we've started to see, and, that, and some of these are then going to go back onto the stage. So it's become very productive. Um, but that's how we rehearsed it. We, I think we had about five or six days rehearsal. Um, actors, I mean, the actor playing Ham had wanted to play it all his life. So that was mm -hmm. great. Um, uh, he was a ham actors. actor. He wanted to be a ham actor. Then, <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's not watching this. Um, and he he does it wonderfully. Sorry. Um, uh, Danny, who plays Clove, is um, one of the, the co-founder of the company with me, uh, and he he does it, his first Beckett. And then the two actors playing <coughs> Nag and Nell are, are older um, and bring all that experience in the theatre to to the material. I do think that there's actually a bit of an explosion of, like you say, this kind of creativity during the COVID thing, because for the very reason that people are able to throw that passion and energy into the things that they really like, because there's less risk involved. Exactly. And I think you know, we've obviously been subject to a, a huge kind of um, uh, uh, lowest common denominator when it comes to media and entertainment. And actually this, because I, I do Egyptology talks. And oh, amazing. Egyptology is also another area that is usually reserved for people that can afford to go on these expensive courses mostly academic or um uh, retired people actually to you know do these courses but actually now that all of these Egyptology societies have moved online the popularity of it has just exploded and you can have super niche um really in-depth sessions that that just everyone's coming to it's great yeah. No, I agree. I think it's been fantastic in that way. And I think that's why I think it's going to be interesting when we get back out there uh, and we find out what the landscape really is um, for what people want to see and do. So, or how we want to create, you know, run our societies. I think that's, there's a lot of things that we're discovering. Mm, very much so. It's almost like we're existing in some kind of apocalyptic play, you know, that uh, we're, we're, well, we're in the that. liminal kind of liminal state or have been for a long time because we're mm -hmm. between like being indoors totally and being outdoors. So we've had time to kind of incubate these new ideas. So I think it could have like great potential for the future. Well, I'm hoping that there will be a huge explosion of creativity and that one of the things I keep saying about this particular podcast is that we're being incredibly eclectic in the subjects we're talking about. And I think it's because we are creating our own egregore here. You know, we've got to, it's like a huge Venn diagram. And I just feel that we're developing this picture. And every time we do these interviews, a little bit more of the color is added and yeah. a little bit more of the perspective is added. And I'm, I'm very interested and proud to be in, involved in this. Now, in terms of um, people wanting to, to watch or listen to the play, it's so important that they do so. So how 
how can they how can they do this what's the process they well, need there, to follow there's several ways of doing it um the uh you have to eventually you have to go to eventbrite eventbrite.com um and you look up uh, elysium theater company uh endgame so that's eventbrite.com uh, elysium theater endgame and you'll be able to register for the um uh, uh the viewing over the weekend uh what you'll get is um uh an e- a confirmation email which will which says view the event page and when you click on the event page that will show you uh how you will access the actual video and it will just basically on saturday and sunday at midnight of um of um uh on friday night it will become active and as soon as you type in the password you'll then be able to watch the video at any point for during that 20 48 hour period um i i can give you a link direct link for that now if you're happy to wait for a second absolutely uh if you type in https uh colon double forward slash bit.ly slash 3hle5 capital y i uh, you'll go straight to the um, Eventbrite page. I, I think you might. I think I'll, I'll send you the latest poster, which has got that on it. If you want Excellent. to advertise it, but if you go on f- to Facebook on the Elysium Theatre page, you'll have the information there. Uh, it's also on our Twitter account, which is at Elysium uh, TC, uh, and it's also on our Instagram account, which is also um, Elysium TC. So all the information will be on Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and I will send you the link now so that anyone who wants to watch it over the weekend can. It's best to uh, register in advance, but you will be able to register over the weekend. But as I say, um, when you register, you will be sent uh, an e- confirmation email. Click on view event page and that will give you everything you need to be able to actually watch the film. Uh, it will. Uh, it lasts, I think, about an hour, 40 minutes, maybe without an interval. Uh, it's very gripping. You can either listen to it as an audio play. You don't have to watch it. Um, but you will, uh, if you watch it, you'll get the dimension of the actor's faces, um, uh, which also makes the pauses very different because when we worked on the pauses with Beckett, of course, the key thing with, with the pauses in Beckett is that they're never dead space, but there's always something happening in those, in the, the emotion of the actors or the resonance of what they're saying. So you can watch it or listen to it either way. Um, and once you've registered it, you can watch it as much as you like over that 48 hour period. Sorry. Uh, after that, I'm afraid it disappears. Okay, so that's. So, but it's a it is a rare opportunity to see this play. It only really gets done in capital cities and arts festivals. Um, it doesn't tend to get done anywhere else uh, because Beckett is quite niche. Um, so if you want to have an experience of Beckett, uh, this is this is a nice way of doing it. That's wonderful. And just finally, what what are your future projects then? Have you got what what are you planning for the future now? Um, well, on Monday, I start rehearsing an Athol Fugard play called Hello and Goodbye, which we're filming. We're, sorry, we're rehearsing in isolation in Hexham up near in Northumberland. Uh, and then we're going to be performing it for one night um, at the National School of Arts Custom Built Theatre in Hartlepool. And that will be live streamed. So you can either watch it that night uh, or you can watch it. It'll be then be available online for a week. I can give you the information for that as well. If you watch it on the night, it's being live streamed. It'll be being performed. You can join in the Q&A afterwards. Um, Then we're going to tour it briefly again in the Northeast um, later this year. Uh, And then in in the new year, we're looking at a doll's house. Uh, Ibsen's a doll's house. We've got lots of other projects that we're thinking about. We want to do more COVID-19 monologues. We're going to take one of the monologues and turn it into a new set of monologues, which we're going to do live as part of this Hadrian's Wall celebration next year. Um, we're looking to try and get a Shakespeare on. And obviously we're ba- we're available for bar mitzvahs, children's parties and wedding. <laughs> So anyone who wants to get in touch with us and wants us to do something, uh, welcome to do it. But but uh, we have a website, www.elysiumtc.co.uk. I'll say that again, www.elysiumtc.co.uk, which needs updating. We need to put all of this new stuff in. Uh, But if you want to find out what we're doing, that's the the place to go. Wonderful. Okay. Any final points from Sarah? 
No, I've got to pop off because I've got uh, three kids waiting for me to take them on a, a beach dinner and uh, oh, oh, that, animals. <laughs> that sounds fun. That sounds fun. <laughs> thank wonderful. you so much, Jake. It was uh, a pleasure. Sarah, pleasure. Great to meet you. It sounds brilliant. Yeah. Jake, absolutely Brilliant. wonderful. It was really great chatting to you. And when lockdown ends, we, we need to meet up. We've got so much we can talk about. That would be it's great. going to be fascinating be as well. But, but thanks for spending time with us here. And I hope the play is a great success. I'll be checking in and watching it because I'm very, very keen. To, to see how how you make it work. So I'm really looking forward to that. And everybody else who was listening in today, thank you very much for listening in. Um, this will be recorded and will be uploaded. Um, it will be available forever on my YouTube and my Facebook wall anyway, but that will drop down, but I'll record it and it will be placed on my uh, YouTube channel as with the rest of the, the, um, the, the play, the, um, performances as well that we've done here and we'll be live again next monday when our guest is maggie latorell um and that's going to be another fascinating one as well and there's a link with jake and various other people as well there so we have a degree of um synergy taking place here which is wonderful so thanks everybody for watching and um go 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 safely bye-bye thank you very much yeah bye-bye thank, you, thank bye. you sarah bye